Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What's that? Oh, is that? Oh, well, whatever. Stormwater management issue. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what we'd like to do is step through tonight through the agenda kind of as a recap for you of where we're at, and then also uh, some additional information and also um, some guidance we'll be looking for the board as we continue to keep working through a number of these issues here. So if we can, Jim, if we can switch over to the uh, presentation here. Um, in regards to the stormwater quality and management, uh, the Board of Commissioners met on January 18, 2012 to begin the discussion on the topic and the consideration of a stormwater utility. Uh, today, the RFQs were due and we received uh, eight proposals in which the uh, township will begin the process of looking through. Um, as part of the st stormwater funding mechanism, um, we received those statements. Uh, Steve will be heading that up along with staff. And then our hope would be is to uh, make a recommendation to the board uh, for consideration of uh, several firms and then what the pricing would be. And then hopefully we begin, can begin the process um, to look at what our options are in regards to uh, a stormwater utility. Uh, some of the work that's been done, uh, Steve had put together uh, some of the work that he's been working on here, and we've detailed some of these here. We'll also make this report available online tomorrow so that everybody can kind of follow along uh, and see the progress that's been made in this area um, in which the North Wayne Field stormwater management system, we know that there's been some problems with that uh, basin functioning down there which some of the work has begun on that, and Steve and his department continue to look on this and then try to uh, uh, get this item, which currently I believe Steve may be out or coming out shortly, um, in which then we'll get the bids back and then bring them in front of the board here as far as the action. Uh, South Wayne Avenue, uh, the Radnor Fire Company, and I'm sure most people realize the, the ponding that takes place in that particular area. Um, what Steve has been looking at is that uh, the project actually had fallen short there, and that system is actually the one that feeds into the uh, athletic field there where the stormwater management system is underground, which as of right now, uh, that system does not function, is not taking the stormwater in. So that's something that we are going to be looking at here of how we can make that final connection there, which we think will have somewhat of an impact there, but uh, due to some uh, utility uh, issues there and conflicts, uh, that system has not been connected. Um, so uh, we think that that's going to be an area in which we'll be able to see some improvement in that particular area. Uh, the North Wayne neighborhood area there too, the neighbors have been involved there. Uh, the association uh, and some cleanup days are removing uh, debris and trash, um, as well as uh, Public Works Department has utilized an external contractor there with some dredging and pumping. And again, that's something that we're going to look to continue on with as well. Uh, the Gulf Creek Stream Bank restoration is another project that's been deferred for a number of years. Uh, Steve is working on that uh, currently, and Gilmore will be preparing the designs and submitting them to DEP uh, for review and approval. As well as the Public Works Department's doing, been doing a lot of routine maintenance with inland, inlet tops, uh, catch basin repairs, uh, continual cleaning, as well as uh, a number of areas where a pipe has been replaced. And then there's two projects that have come up that Steve will be using the emergency contractor this week uh, on Barley Cone and Windermere uh, to get those uh, moved along. In regards to the uh, departmental cap capital equipment, the Board of Commissioners met on January 30th, 2012 and discussed the capital equipment requirements for the township. Um, outside of the current general fund transfers, which are required by our administrative code, the township do does not currently fund the capital needs of the various departments. And Bill, I'm going to let you take over on this area. Sure. This slide is a summary of the different departments uh, in terms of what, what the capital dollars would be for 2013 through 2018. Uh, this information was presented in summary form at, at the, uh, the meeting in January. The numbers might have changed slightly as we've had some, some different budget work sessions with the different departments, so some of these numbers might have changed. But this is how it exists now. Uh, ranging anywhere from roughly 500,000 up to 956,000, uh, depending on 
you know, the, the, the timing of vehicles to be replaced. When you take a look at that information, uh, what those total dollar amounts are, and you, you net out or subtract out the amount of the general fund allocation that's required in the administrative code, uh, there also would be a portion of those replacements that would be funded through the sanitary sewer fund, uh, as well as the township gets uh, public education grant funding from our, our franchise agreements with Comcast and Verizon. So that portion would be subtracted out. The additional capital requirements that have been built into the five-year financial forecast are, these, are the net additional funding required numbers that you see at the bottom of this table. Uh, and again, uh, for purposes up to this point, uh, we're using the plan as it was put together by the different departments as, as just that, as a planning document. Uh, there's obviously a lot more discussion and review that's going to be required before any, before obviously this gets adopted or any equipment is slated to be purchased. Uh, but for the planning purposes, uh, these were the amounts used. Moving along to the meeting that we had in February regarding the township's unfunded liabilities as they pertain to other post-employment benefits, uh, the pensions, and the compensated leave balances. Uh, the board did meet on the 21st. We stepped through all three of these items uh, in pretty good detail, explaining exactly what they were and then what the unfunded portions were at that time. Since that meeting, uh, there have been two primary updates to report on. First of all, with regard to the compensated absence number, uh, the December 31st, 2010 financial statements of the township showed a liability on the compensated absences of roughly five and a half million. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing our December 31st, 2011 financial statements, not 2012. Uh, and that liability number will be 2,752,310. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail here momentarily. The other primary change uh, that we knew was coming, but now we have the actual numbers since the pension actuary report uh, was submitted uh, or completed uh, back in February. The, the January 1st, 2011 actuary report had not been completed yet, but now that it now it has. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail here momentarily. Again, the compensated leave balance is showing a reduction in liability of roughly $1.8 there are two primary factors to that reduction. The first being that uh, 2010 and prior, the calculations from the township did not, uh, did not limit the amount of sick time at retirement to the maximums that are included in the collective bargaining agreements. Uh, right now, those amounts are capped, 2,400 for police and 2,100 for civilian, and then it's 45% of those. The spreadsheet had a calculation error that didn't factor in the 2400 or the 2100. So that's part of it. The other part uh, was that in 2011, several employees, um, which had some of the larger balances, did in fact leave the township, which resulted in either paying out the liability or, uh, and or eliminating the liability. With regard to OPEB, uh, since February, there, have not, there has not been a whole lot of change. Uh, the, the, only, the primary change to talk about is with regard to what is going to be in our, 2000, our December 31st, 2011 financial statements. Uh, the statement of net assets will show a liability of roughly 12.6 million, whereas the 2010, that statement of net assets was around nine and a half million uh, as a result of not funding beyond the pay-as-you-go amount. Um, that's the difference between those two numbers is the, uh, the if you'll recall that meeting, the annual required contribution, the difference between the full ARC and the pay-as-you-go number, which was a little over $3 million. Uh, in addition, uh, the CARFAC has outlined a project that will evaluate the liability from a market and legal standpoint uh, in terms of what, uh, where the benefit levels are in surrounding areas, as well as what is obligated by law and what is uh, within the township's ability to change and then from there uh, develop ideas on addressing the reduction and or funding the liability over the long term. So that is something that's the CARFAC is working on with the administration right now. Uh, at the same time we are working with Mock and Hop for an updated actuarial report on the OPEB. Similar to the pension this is uh, some, this is a report that gets updated every two years uh, and for Radnor it's it 
it's it the OPEB update runs one year behind when the pension uh, update is completed. So that is something that we have submitted all the paperwork and numbers to Mock and Hop, and they are working on currently. With regard to the pension update since February, again, this is the result of the January 1st, 2011 actuary report coming out. Uh, as we had touched on that meeting, we, we knew that the numbers were going to get worse before they got better, uh, and they did. Uh, the UAAL that is shown on this table is the unfunded actuarial crude liability. Uh, as we reported back in February, the total, the aggregate between the two funds was a little over 12 million. That number, uh, as of January 1st, 2011, has grown to over 22, reducing the percentage funded status from 75.6 down to 62, which puts the township at a distress level two. Um, and as we talked about back in February, again, this is this is the result of several factors. Um, less than assumed market results or market returns on the asset side, as well as greater than assumed benefits uh, going out on the liability side. Uh, so a quick comparison of the change in assets and liabilities, uh, which calculate down to the change in the uh, unfunded actuarial crude liability. Uh, and you can see that uh, the assets reducing, uh, in addition to liabilities increasing, resulted in the $9.8 million change in that number. How that impacts the financial forecast is immediately there, well, for 2013, as we had discussed back in February, that the township's MMO, or minimum municipal obligation, uh, will increase to help begin to fund this. Uh, the increase for 2013 is roughly one and a half million. Uh, it's built into the forecast that that increase uh, beyond 2013, so for 14, 2014 through 18, it's assumed that that MMO will increase by 5% per year. Um, and over the long term, uh, as, as reported by Mock and Hop and as touched on in that meeting in February, you know, all other things being equal, uh, what needs to happen is make sure that the actual results meet or do better than assumptions, both on the, the revenue side and the benefit side. Uh, and that's a matter of managing it moving forward. Uh, but theoretically, correcting the assumptions and funding the MMO annually over time should correct this so long as um, the assumptions are met or uh, things do better. In regards to the next time, which was the staffing requirements, the board met on March 19, 2012 and discussed uh, staffing requirements for each of the various departments. As a recap with that, uh, Public Works uh, was looking at no increase, Recreation was no increase, Administration was no increase, Finance no increase, Police were looking for five additional officers, and Community Development were looking for one additional code official, one part-time administrative assistant. Um, when we look at the um, staffing requirements here, uh, two things to point out, um, is, which demonstrates the addition, but also, too, the recommendation will be made to the Board. Uh, is in the administrative area, the economic development manager's position would not be filled. Uh, that would be eliminated, and the myself uh, would take on those additional responsibilities with the assistance of the various department heads, uh, depending on uh, what project we're working on, uh, to pull in the expertise from the different departments, um, as well as the finance, having a part-time human resources manager, that that position would also be eliminated and those responsibilities merged with the assistant finance director's position, resulting in those cost savings. And Bill, I'll let you sure. cover those. The, the, again, what we're trying to do with these updates is tie them back into the financial forecast that we've been working on and continue to work on. So the numbers that are demonstrated on this page uh, with regard to the police officers in the two positions in community development, uh, those are adding to uh, and I'm getting ahead a little bit, but we, the forecast is built based on, we have a base set of numbers, which is kind of, which is the as we exist now numbers, and then those are modified to include these different uh, staff, or these different expense items. So with regard to the staffing requirements, uh, the, the, the positive numbers, the additions, you'll see as additions to the expenditure base uh, and the administrate the economic development position and the part-time HR manager are reductions to the base number. So, um, th th hopefully, that'll be a little bit clearer here momentarily. But these are the impacts over the years in terms of or for hiring each of these positions. 
Uh, with regard to updates to the financial forecast, uh, if you'll recall back at the end of January, we had presented a, an initial view of what that five-year forecast looks like. Since that time, as part of various budget meetings, the financial forecast was reorganized to pull information from all of the line items within the township's funds uh, rather than building purely on the aggregate data. Uh, that became, it became evident that uh, we would need to forecast at that level uh, in order to have the ability to adjust significant items from department to department. So if, for example, if there were significant changes in the finance department, working off the aggregate data would be very difficult to drill in and make those changes without making some major assumptions. So now we're forecasting off of every line item in the budget. Uh, we've also added a 2013 working budget, which pulls off the first year of it, uh, of the forecast, uh, which was important because we've had each of the departments in the, in the forecast entering information and working with their 2013 budgets already. Uh, and they have a working budget that is currently under construction. Uh, then there is the five-year financial forecast, which represents right now 2014 through 18. Uh, that is similar to what was presented at the end of January. That really hasn't changed much in terms of the presentation. And we have also added an extended 10-year forecast, which is intended to identify trends beyond the five-year forecast which may or may not be helpful when we are starting, making, starting to make some of the larger decisions. Finally, the forecast includes the ability to work with different scenarios that build off of base information, uh, which then provide a modified look at the numbers. So uh, we tried to break it down into workable pieces uh, that we, we know where we're starting from and we are making incremental changes and we can track those uh, that all, and then ultimately end up at some modified uh, budget and forecast. So with, uh, with the additional OPEB, the, the full OPEB funding getting all the way up to the, uh, what, what was called the annual required contribution, which if you'll recall was a little bit north of 5.2 million per year, which includes the pay-as-you-go portion that, that we currently do plus the additional funding to set money aside for the future liability, as well as the increased MMO obligations for pension, as well as the staffing changes in capital. Uh, these are the revenue and expense numbers. And we're also, while there, there is a difference in the base revenues and modified revenues, those are for some non-tax related revenues that we are working with currently uh, at the administrative level. Um, but the difference in expenses, which is what we're focusing on tonight, that's why there's the difference between what is called the base and the modified expenditures. Looking at the, the percentage growth over time in those numbers, uh, it, two observations, I guess, real briefly, and where the numbers are at now is, first of all, on the expense side, uh, the expense modification is shows almost a 20% increase in expenditures just in 2013, uh, which is a big percentage. <laughs> uh, and after that, uh, looking at the 2014 through 18 numbers, the modified revenue and modified expense numbers are, are growing at roughly the same pace. Granted, the expenses are a little bit higher now, um, but we're working on those numbers, and, and I would suspect that those will change as we go through this year. Uh, which I, I guess is an indication that there is a structural problem that exists now. Uh, mathematically solving that would seem to indicate that after it's solved once, it's the, the expense and revenues seem to trend the same way. Going to it a little bit more detail about okay. what... Can you go back? Sure. So <clears throat> for 2013, you're projecting, based on where we are right now, that our expenses are going to grow three times the rate of our revenues. Yeah, a, f a fully loaded expense number, that's, that's what the, the percentage would be. If, if we were to decide that's the route we were going to go. At this point, it's, they're, they're numbers built into a forecast. It's not meant to show any kind of plan or decision making. I think, Kevin, as it goes on to the next one, I think you'll see the difference of where those are coming at with the OPEB funding and that. I think this might 
make a little bit clearer? Yeah, so as we, as we step through this whole process, the, and again, going back to the, the concept of having a base, a base to start from and then incremental changes on top of that, this is the modified expenses by type that we've worked on so far. Uh, and again, the, the, the OPEB number by far is the biggest piece of this. Uh, then there's the capital funding and staffing modifications. What's not included in here, at least that you can identify, is the increase in MMO funding, the pension piece of this. And the reason why I didn't include it here is because uh, we, are contract we are legally obligated to pay our MMOs annually. Uh, that is built into the base numbers. And when we start digging into details, that that's evident and you can find it easily, um, but it's not shown on this page uh, because it's not really a decision we have to make based on our staffing level as, as they are now. Bill, on this slide, unless I'm missing something, there's only three colors and there's five on the right. Yes. Are they so small I don't see them or are they blank because they haven't been filled in yet? They're blank because we haven't filled them in yet. And those are the facility funding and the community organization funding. Uh, and as the, the schedule that, that we're holding to for this year, those are meetings that haven't yet happened yet. So as we have those meetings and recommendations are made for funding, those will be added to this. So if I'm understanding you correctly, <clears throat> we're not likely to see any changes in revenues based on where we understand we are today because all these future meetings focus on expenditures. Is that accurate? Well, administratively, we're looking at, at some non-tax revenue changes. Uh, we'll touch on one later tonight, uh, but there's other changes as well. Um, so where the numbers are, uh, the, the, the base net revenues, as shown on here for 13 through 18, the net revenues under expenditures, uh, are shown in the darker shaded colors when we add in all of the modified expenditures uh, in addition to the base those are shown in the the more lightly colored bars uh, and uh, I, without the additional funding uh, that we that that's the reason why those are upside down and negative so kind of getting to the end of uh, the updates to the financial forecast this chart here represents a mathematical calculation, and it's the same calculation that was presented back in January in terms of uh, a mo an implied change in real estate taxes in order to in order to make these net revenues be zero. It would require these percentage changes to the millage rate if that was all that the township was going to affect to, to solve the, the funding issue. So as, the, as we've talked about, the base, there's the base, then there's the modified, and then there's the third piece, which is the forecast plan. And right now those are all zeros um, because those are things that we're working on. And as we get through this whole process and start to actually develop the 13 budget and the financial forecast and actually put a plan together, uh, that's when those numbers will be added to this as well. So taking that mathematical calculation one step further uh, and applying it to the millage rate that the township currently has, which is 3.7511, uh, these would be the millage rates. Uh, and again, it's a mathematical calculation to demonstrate the issue. Uh, there's a third line in there that's gray and you can't really see it very well. It's called the forecast plan. As, as we work on developing the 13 budget and the five-year forecast, that, that will change as well and that will be shown on, on this graph as well. So that's, that's, the, that's the updated forecast with uh, presenting the same information that was presented back in January now with these different meetings that we've had, building in those numbers fully, fully loaded. Uh, if, if we were to throw the switch on January 1, 2013 and fix everything right then. So that's what the numbers would look like. I think the transition from that now is over to um, some of the planning meetings that I had scheduled with staff actually beginning to address a lot of these issues because I think as Bill has mentioned, a lot of it is you see the numbers, so now it's, it's 
where the work begins now on our side to look at how can we make a lot of these things work within a reasonable um, approach because the, the reality of actually looking at increases at the numbers and the percentages, um, I don't think anyone would even think of considering those. So now is where the work has begun. And just kind of to the brief overview of these, um, of the different dates with the meeting, with the meetings with all departments, and part of that was uh, department heads, supervisors, staff, uh, union representatives had participated in these meetings. Uh, in which we covered uh, some of the areas here, which I'll briefly, briefly touch base on individually with each of the uh, different departments and then also getting everyone back together again. Um, so just as a review of those two meetings um, that we had, uh, the overviews, try to get the goals and objectives of what we want to try to accomplish over the two days, uh, going to mission statements, which should match up of where, where you're going as a department, where are we going as a township into the future. Reviewed the issues that we have discussed, which we just basically went through uh, with the different departments and the special topics. We had present presentations made by DIVIT, which is the Delaware Valley Health Insurance Trust, is, which is the uh, agency in the consortium of different uh, municipal governments here to help reduce our health care costs, keep them manageable, about what the trends are in health care, what we should be aware of, plan designs and which modifications and changes that possibly could be made um, to uh, result in some cost savings. We had travelers also um, here as well to talk about insurance trends as well as workman's comp trends. Mockenhop also was here to present in regards to the pensions and the issues and concerns uh, that we currently have and which the township is facing. Um, and then we went through by each department analyzing, working on creating their 2013 budget model, a 2013 capital equipment plan, a five-year financial forecast, and a 15-year financial plan. Some of the intent behind that is not only to be able to set a course that residents and businesses, the board and staff can follow, but also to hope to shape uh, decisions that are made into the future so that based on these models, the board can make decisions on presentations that are made at any particular time throughout the year or someone may come in and request funding for a particular project to be able to look at these models and say whether we can or we can't that we can't fund this because based on our plan but also it's helpful for whether or not you know managers change department heads change board members change that there's a plan that everyone can follow and try to go along with that which again has to be fluid and change because based on if revenues increase uh, those can be modified where, again, too, where you're looking at the taxpayer or the businesses, where, again, you can modify those, too, as well. So it's something that's fluid and workable, but someone can follow and track, too. Um, so we went through a lot of that in which we are starting to build those um, processes, starting to build those models of where we are, taking in consideration and direction from the board, uh, as well as from the public, from CARFAC, as their contributions that they're made to try to continue to keep working on this. And now is the time for us to start working on these. Uh, it's the appropriate time, and we'll continue to keep doing that. Um, and then the second session that we had was, again, look at the uh, forecast. A lot of it was the sustainability of the operational financial uh, stability of the township. Again, a lot of the decisions that uh, we need to go through and the change is something that has to be sustainable. Uh, and again, a lot of that ties back to how we operate performance standards, services, and programs. Uh, of what the uh, Board of Commissioners and the community are looking for, uh, looking at the opportunity to consolidate facilities. Do we each have to have our own building and facility? Uh, what are the needs? Are they meeting the needs? Um, sale of real estate. Um, is it time for us to look at actually shedding ourselves of some real estate at this particular time? Comparing ourselves with surrounding communities and the services they provide as well as staffing levels and millage rates. And also, uh, one of the things that I know has been uh, recommended, not only from the survey, and fr uh, but also from a number of residents of looking at a creation of a dashboard in which the public can actually refer to on a regular basis. Um, the idea would be a monthly basis uh, to see key performance indicators. How are we doing as a township? How are we performing? Uh, and something which I think also goes back into accountability to all of us of how we are held accountable to what we do and how we perform. Um, and then we went into the afternoon session there of just reviewing the data for tonight's presentation, a wrap-up of our current planning meetings, and then we'll be scheduling the next phases of those meetings, which will continue here in May based on some of the feedback we'll get from the Board of Commissioners this evening. 
Some of the items we'll be looking for the, uh, from the Board of Commissioners are is outsourcing to do the analysis um, once and for all to actually have the discussion in regards to is it better in-house to continue with services or to contract these services out to look at a real detailed uh, analysis of how that is done. The cost impacts only short term and long term, but also when you look at internally, what are those costs going to be for equipment replacement? What are we looking at as personnel costs? And then also, too, if there was an outsourcing, what could we look at from an outside contractor? Could we also see uh, you know, uh, prices spike as well? So that's something we have to look at in trends. Uh, compare those costs, the impacts long term. What other services would be impacted by outsourcing? You know, would we see a reduction if we outsource one particular area? Would we see a reduction in service in another area that would impact? Uh, and also a key point is the impact of the OPEB and pension. What does that mean? And that's something that Mockenhop will be working with us on. So again, dealing with real numbers, not hypotheticals to say we think or kind of or should have, but really uh, look at the hard, hard numbers on those. Um, we know that union contracts and negotiations will be upcoming. Uh, both those contracts expire on December 31st of 2013. Um, so we have started that process from the administrative side, looking at a lot of the different items uh, and something that uh, we'll continue to keep working on as we move forward. Um, one of the items we thought we would look at here and look for the board for some guidance is the consolidation of facilities and services. When we look at township-owned buildings, we have the library, this building here, the senior center, Sulpizio Gym, which is a leased facility from the school district, uh, Studio 21, in which the township provides uh, money to their operation, and the public works building. Does it make sense for us to continue to operate independently, uh, knowing that we have a building here in which we have space, which we do lease some space uh, to a tenant, looking at additional tenants, but also, too, we know that the library building uh, has some needs and concerns. The senior center has some uh, concerns. When we look at the public works building, too, having a facility in the middle of town where we have to store materials off-site, does it make sense for us to be in that particular area? You know, those are something I think we need to look at. Should we, our operations be combined in the joint facilities or creation of a campus uh, to really look to reduce costs and operate? I guess, in a smart particular way, and what are the advantages and disadvantages? So that's something we'll be looking for from the board this evening. On um, the sale of real estate, uh, we know that we have a real estate assessment that uh, our hope would be that we'll have a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners at your May 14th meeting, um, looking at what our land has value and what could be sold, the impact for future use in buildings and facilities. Uh, in, in the CBFAC report, there was recommendations on particular properties to be looked at, um, we would also ask from administration recommendations from myself would be to look at this building itself, the public works facility and the Kreutzberg Center, being that we have a tenant that has been in there for a good long time, the mainline school night, which does an outstanding job. Also the opportunity of whether or not they would be looking to take that on because I think as part of this we have to look at the significant amount of money that will have to be put into these facilities. Um, it's my opinion in the past the township doesn't do a good job at managing properties or real estate. I don't know if that's the business we want to be in to be able to do that. But if we do, we need to fund these properties. We need to make the conversions from residential to commercial uses um, and actually lay this out of what it is going to cost because I don't think we're in a position to continue to put Band-Aids on a lot of these problems because the numbers are getting bigger and bigger as we continue to go along. So that's something we're going to look for the board as well for that in, uh, decision. Uh, voluntary contribution for services program. Uh, we have submitted a proposal to Villanova, Eastern, and Cabrini for their review and consideration. Um, we're hopeful we will hear back from them shortly. Uh, the formula was based on the 13% of real estate taxes which residents and businesses currently paid, which we think based on the services that they enjoy from the township, uh, from police protection, from fire protection, from public work services that that are provided, um, you know, maybe it's biased on one end, but I think it's a, uh, something that is fair, uh, that they contribute uh, to those services which they directly uh, derive from the township. Um, as part of one of the items, to at least to start, start the discussion, one of the items we had looked at is uh, a data dashboard, uh, which again, uh, we had looked at um, in a couple different areas. I think some of the uh, real concerns uh, that we have is that we think this is a great 
a great idea for the township and for the residents to be able to track the financial activities and uh, actual performance of services by the township. Um, some of the concern that's been raised, I know, by uh, one of the members of the Car uh, CARFAC group is having the appropriate information and data to be able to communicate with each other in the way of the software so that we're not taking a lot of data and trying to re-enter it over and over again. But this is just one example that they had here which shows uh, key performance factors which can be broken down into um, the performance by department, a performance by the township which would actually just show kind of the services in that. This is one that was a model that was based on the fire department which calls, uh, calls for services which again this is something that would be able to track performance in needs so that as different departments or community groups or organizations come forward with requests for more than likely uh, additional expenses, you should be able to track back exact, exactly to a factual type, real time, hopefully, um, performance gear to be able to show that if we are looking for, say the fire company is looking for additional funding for something, there should be very easy to be able to show that their calls for services are going up. Uh, and again, this is something that would be developed. This is a model we wanted to show the board and get the board at least thinking about uh, doing something like this. I think we have a lot of talent in this community that would be able to provide us those key performance indicators of what we should be looking at and how to build these in a, in a cost effective way. Um, with the real estate taxes, Bill, I'm going to let you take those. Sure. One of the one of the items that we've been trying to uh, to make sure that there's full disclosure on, it's been included in the budget documents for the township for the last couple of years, is just making sure that the residents uh, and businesses understand that the, the property tax makeup here in the Radnor Township, uh, the Radnor Township represents 13% of the total real estate tax bill, the county is 17% and the school district is 70. Uh, we did a, as part of what's going to end up being a much larger review of millage rates and comparisons. Uh, we, we took a quick look at where the county stacks up in terms of Delaware, Montgomery, and Chester, and the millage rates as they exist today, um, and showing that it, you know, Delaware County is at the 5.3, Montgomery at 3.152, and 3.965 for Chester. So uh, the, there, it, it rarely does a day go by, especially this time of year, uh, when the township has its real estate tax bills out, um, do we it, do we not get a phone call from a handful of residents, you know, wondering why um, why their school district tax has changed or what the school district's doing here or there? Um, so there there is a, uh, a a sense in the community, at least based on the phone calls we get and the people who come into our office, that uh, there's not everyone's aware of the distinction between the township and the school district. So. Uh, as part of our efforts to make sure that people know uh, in terms of the Radnor Township piece of this, uh, where their tax dollars are going, uh, we'll continue, continue to keep this information up to date and, and out in front of folks. Just mention when you put out statistics, if you're going to put millage and compare millage, you, you have to put the assessment for each county because that affects, you know, I mean, if Delaware County has a smaller assessment than the other two counties, generate the same amount of revenue, they'd have to have more millage. Just putting millage out doesn't mean anything unless you show the assessment. Um, also too, what we'll be doing is preparing as well as we mentioned previously about the staff compiling the comparative data uh, for the board to review at your August uh, special meetings um, as well. And we'll make sure that we address the issues with the different county ones too as part of that. So, um, and I think also too, one of the things we're gonna look for the board tonight is level of services provided to residents and really looking from the board of commissioners is the level of service that you'd like to see Radnor Township now and in the future. And that includes program services provided to the township, to our residents, businesses, and educational institutions because as, as part of this, this all ties together as we continue to keep working on this and continue to keep building um, a budget and trying to make this as tight as can be but also knowing from the board a level of service that, that you're looking for, which will help us instead of us taking us in a certain particular, particular way and the board saying, well, we really we're heading in the wrong direction to try to get some input. So as we go back here with some of the items we're gonna try to look from the board is, you know, the outsourcing, consolidation of facilities and services, sale of real estate, 
um, you know, and the level of services of where, knowing that specifically we're not getting that from you, but kind of general overview of what the board is looking for. Uh, upcoming meetings and discussions that are planned uh, in May, uh, the township facilities and infrastructure that'll deal with all the various buildings as well as the infrastructure from stormwater uh, to roads. Uh, in June will be tree maintenance and the real estate assessment evaluation update. And then in the July meeting will be the various groups coming in and organizations uh, and the funding of the fire companies. They will be making presentations as well that we've asked them to make similar to what we are looking at too with the one year five and the 15 uh, to be able to look at their projections again as well as we try to build this model so this way that everyone can base decisions on a particular model given in a certain place and time. And with that, we look for some for the Board of Commissioners comments, discussion. Well, I know over the, um, the last 10 years, there's been discussion about at the, uh, library, at the uh, post office property, the library and Studio 21 and the senior center uh, there was a proposal by Keating, and then there was a proposal by a, a local group. But I would think someday that property might have an opportunity to be developed along with, uh, without public funds, along with uh, the property behind the Presbyterian Church. I mean, you know, to get, you know, everybody says about, John keeps talking about putting money aside to build a parking garage, and, you know, it's $25,000 of space, but there was a proposal to build a garage there and fund that by either stores or condos around it. And, uh, um, you know, we pick up 150 additional parking spots. So as the economic development person, <laughs> you know, there's, there are two areas that I think eventually someone can come in in the right economic climate and uh, develop something there which would give us some extra parking and facilities in South Wayne and in North Wayne. Um, first, let me say that I, and I'm sure all of us, seven of us, truly appreciate the tremendous work that is being put in at this point towards our budgeting for this year and beyond. It's so much, it's so helpful to us to have time for this kind of thoughtful analysis, and especially to have time for CARFAC to put thoughtful analysis into all of these issues that when, in the fall, we are really putting our numbers down on paper and, and working through how we're going to do this, that we've had this, you know, months and months of discussion about it. So thank you. This process is excellent. Um, as far as the modified expenses that we just saw charted, I mean, I think we all have acknowledged, I, I think we've all said at one time or another, this isn't, these long-term obligations didn't come, come about in one year, and I don't think any of us anticipate solving them in one year. You know, we have, at this point, to figure out a um, stable way to address this issue, to start funding it, and um, to address what I think you called it, nicely termed our structural problem. <laughs> and that's our aim, so, and that's what the next several months we'll get some advice from CARFAC and, um, and start coming up with a way to address that. But for anybody who's looking at those charts and sees that modified expense level, that's just never going to happen. I mean, we're never going to solve this problem this year going forward. Um, as far as the consolidation goes, um, the, I think we're talking more, I hope we're talking more about consolidating buildings and not services. Um, you know, for, for the library, I'd say their services have been consolidated year after year after year because they are a county system, and it continues to be more and more centralized. So um, it's, it's really, I think, just to clarify, we're talking just buildings and facilities and sharing spaces, which makes all the sense in the world for our community organizations who have many of the same patrons. Um, and if they aren't the same patrons or they don't interact, we'd like to see them interact. Um, Commissioner, you're exactly right on the fa it's facilities, it's buildings, right. that's it. And I, again, I'm completely, and I think m most of my colleagues are very open to discussions like that. Um, these are long-term discussions, obviously, given our situation, but I, I, definitely we, we can go down that road. The um, comparison of ourselves and our staffing levels and whatnot, um, 
I think that's a very useful exercise and, and worth going through. Last year at this time, we had a chart we were working with called the Comparison of Highly Rated Townships in PA. And it sets forth um, the bond rating, the populations, assessed values, market per capita, millage rates. It doesn't actually give assessments of types of services, but um, this was immensely helpful last year when we were talking about trash service and whatnot to have a good, uh, solid analysis of what our neighbors, what kind of debt our neighbors are taking on, what kind of spending they're doing, what kind of rating they have. This was based on 2009 numbers, or I guess the 2010, so it was before the 2010 census. Um, so having this updated, I think, will be helpful for all of us in making some of these decisions. And then finally, to pipe in on the level of service, I mean, I feel personally like our services have been cut significant, and we have really cut back over the last two years. We have cut back significantly, and I know our residents feel it. Um, and I think one of the things a res you know, general residents take pride in is the level of our services. Even though they're cut back, we still have an excellent, excellent level of service from trash to police to sanitate to um, snow, leaf. snow, leaf, to our highways. Um, I don't want to see us cut back any farther, further if we don't have to. I would rather see us, um, I mean, I don't see where we could without significantly affecting services, which I don't, I don't know which one you would take away. Um, and the way our public works system works if you take away from one, you take away from them all because there's so much interaction. So those are my comments for now. Uh, sure I, I just wanted to, since I have to leave at 730, um, one of the things you have to put in your thought process when you're talking about the garage or any facility, you won't find another place in Radnor Township to locate anything. We spent two years on the Radnor Elementary School and, you know, 20 sites. And the thing is, is that if you wanted to move that garage, there's no one in Radnor Township that is going to want that anywhere near their neighborhood with the trucks coming there. If you're going to move the police station, there's no one in Radnor Township. The people that I represent complain about the cars going up Brookside, and, you know, but they're here now. So that's one of the things you have to put in your thought process. I know you had talked about an indoor facility and getting rid of Sulpizio, and I told you at that time, you'll never cite an indoor facility because you're bringing extra traffic and, you know, and no community will want that. So that's one of the problems we have in Radnor when you want to cite something. I just wanted to, to mention that it's a very difficult process to add uh, a facility that's going to increase traffic in, in a neighborhood. So uh, just my ideas then. First, regarding stormwater, I still think it's premature to engage a consultant at this point. There's policy decisions that we have to make as a township, and I think we should be making those decisions and then engaging the expert to tell us how to do that as opposed to engage the expert to tell us what to do. Um, similarly for the capital, I think there's a, you know, it's t we, we can't really make capital decisions now because I think we have policy decisions to make, so, or at least for the large capital projects. So uh, some of the other things that we talked about will, di will dictate what kind of capital decisions we make. Uh, for our OPEB pension and leave obligations, I think our, our big priority is our contracts. We've got to get into the contracts and correct the elements of it that we believe are unsustainable for us because um, we can't really make, we can't really go to the public and say we're going to change your services and raise your taxes and do things that you don't like while we still have these structural problems in the contracts. So, so if we think the contracts are unfavorable to us, which I, I think many of us do, then we have to address that, those aspects before we can make a lot of the other changes. Uh, outsourcing, I think we have to examine it. It's going to, the details are going to tell us whether it's good or bad. My bias would be against it, but uh, the numbers might be so overwhelming that we're for, not forced to do it, but the, the numbers might be very overwhelming. Um, as far as consolidating operations, I'm all for it, but I echo the concerns that Bill identified. Uh, I would also add one that I'd be very, probably unwilling to change the location of the library, to put up the library in a away from the downtown. So uh, I could see other services consolidating downtown with the library, but I, I don't think I would be supportive of moving the library from the downtown. Um, real estate, again, premature in my opinion to engage an expert. A lot of the decisions that we would make 
our policy decisions or, or political decisions that will be made through this kind of process. And it, my, my sense is that what we should do instead is identify what we might be willing to do, get those out, a, a small number of those out in public, and then see what kind of support we have for those kind of things before we engage an expert. Um, the dashboard idea, I'm all for it, but I think it's going to be difficult to take complex circumstances like this and put them in, you know, nice graphics with simple indicators, but, you know, I wouldn't stop you. I'd be, you know, certainly supportive if that can be done. Um, level of service, again, everybody wants the services to stay high, but some of us believe that we're not paying for those services now and we've created a system that's unsustainable. So b before we can make decisions about what's going to possibly go away, we have to try to correct the elements of our two contracts that are, uh, are in our opinion, problematic. So that, that's kind of in a nutshell. I think the most important thing right now is to get into the specifics of the two contracts and uh, try to identify the, thing, the, the corrective actions that we want and then take those actions and then based upon what we do or do, what kind of changes we can or can't make in those two contracts, then we have to uh, adjust and start paying for the obligations that we have. So uh, that's, uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you. The uh, level of service issue is probably the most difficult to define because I'll be quite frankly, I don't think most of the residents of this township know all the services that they have opportunities to avail themselves of. Um, last year, walking around talking to my uh, constituents, people did not want the level of services to go down. And they also indicated they were willing to pay for that level of service. Um, I was wondering, Bill, your uh, revenue projections. 2%, is that just based on historical? Uh, how did you come up with that? In most cases, yes. It's based on, uh, first of all, historical trends, and then second of all, any kind of known variations that we can predict. For example, uh, the Community Development Department, I think, is one of the better examples because they, they tend to have great fluctuations from year to year depending on what projects come in. So we tried to just, just narrow down those revenues on what we consider to be predictable and normal. So. Uh, outside of that, when it comes to fines and uh, forfeitures that are generated by the police department, it's based on their staffing levels and, and historical trends. The real estate tax uh, is based on our current millage, but it does assume some historical trend in terms of the assessed valuation growing, which is roughly a half a percent. And then uh, the departments, it was left up to the departments on how they projected their growth in terms of the departmental earnings, which include uh, recreational programming, police extra duty, the rear yard trash collection, the bulk pickup, those kind of things, which I think at the end of the day is mostly, you know, based on what, who our current customers are and projecting that over, you know, projecting that out over time. No, I was just thinking that in the near past, we approved the Luella Mansion, uh, we approved a 10 house subdivision on county line and uh, and in front of the uh, working through the process now is the West Wayne development. So right there, that's a significant increase in our assessments. So I think we do have some uh, information we can use to try to make a better projection. Fair we also, we're seeing a lot of tear down rebuilds. So we know that the, they increase the assessed valuation. So there, there's some things I think we do know or can at least make an intelligent uh, discussion of as far as the revenue side. Um, and I understand the departments are going to look at other opportunities for increasing revenues, other services they may be able to provide. Yes, that is correct. That's currently being looked at too um, within, within a reasonable type charge but again I think that uh, like Kevin's department and uh, police department uh, public works again have looked at these pass-through costs where maybe before the township didn't didn't get those different fees for plan reviews and those types of items which again uh, have been a lot more aggressive in being able to get those revenues back and then as far as OPEB and unfunded liabilities uh, 
I think we're going to have a, a much lengthier discussion about those because we have to contextualize that. Radnor Township isn't the only township with this problem. Um, and we also, we can look at other things like maybe we don't have to put as much in that fund right now, but we, we can put triggers in there like what, once it exceeds a certain percentage of the general fund, then we have to do additional things. So you know, there's got to be some reasonable number. The pay-as-you-go number now is reasonable. Uh, but a reasonable number that percentage of the general fund that can be expended upon not just current obligations but future obligations. That's all I have. I'll take it. Um, I, I think it's... it's <laughs> Phil's going to leave the room. Um, it's, it's too early, really, to have an answer uh, to all these things, but I've been paying attention for about five years now to everything that's been going on. And it's, um, you know, I've, when I look at the, uh, the gap that we have, it's, it's, it's very substantial. Uh, there's no way that any one thing we do in the next 10 years could solve that problem. So it's going to be a, in my opinion, it'll be a, a mix or a menu of items that we have to look at. We're going to really need the, uh, in, in my opinion, in terms of OPEB and pensions, we're going to need the unions to come to the table with us and be partners. Instead of us and them, it has to be we. Uh, they have a vested interest in that uh, working as well. Um, and without their help, I don't know how we could possibly bridge the gap. I, I can't imagine a 35% um, tax increase, uh, you know, getting our millage rate up to five and a half points, five and a half mils. Uh, would be a challenge even over a long period of time. Uh, although I do uh, feel that um, we provide most of the services that we enjoy, so our millage rate should, in, in, in that context, be higher than what the county charges. But at the same time, we can't really afford to keep taxing uh, all the residents. Um, so I'm going to be looking to the unions this year uh, to help us um, address the OPEB and pension issue, because that, they have control on that as well. Uh, as far as infrastructure, we've known for many years that uh, stormwater, sewers, uh, streets, bridges, all have been an issue. It's an issue for the states and, and the counties. It's an issue here. Uh, that's another area that um, hasn't been addressed properly in at least five years that I know of. I think uh, we have to look at a very long-term approach there. Uh, may involve uh, taking on more debt to cover that. Uh, but on the flip side, maybe we have a chance to divest or sell off some of the properties we own. The building we're sitting in now might be an opportunity um, either to sell or to lease more space from it. We have other parcels and properties throughout the township that I believe has some commercial value that might be worth selling off uh, and using that money to help offset some of the infrastructure costs that we have going long term. Uh, and in terms of services, we certainly need to deliver services more efficiently. I'm not convinced we're, we're providing those uh, services efficiently at this point. I know everyone's doing more and more with less and less, but we're not so sure we're at the efficient frontier on those. And then uh, there may need to be some cuts in the services, the, the types of services we provide. Uh, in the end, if we can't afford our OPEB and pensions, we really have to look at the resourcing and staff and look at, um, in reality, you know, can we afford to keep doing this? Uh, I don't, I'm not contemplating that we have to lay folks off, but maybe over a long period of time through attrition, we don't hire folks. We don't uh, continue to build these departments any more than they already are, and we address it that way. So I'm hoping to see, you know, by the end of, the, you know, maybe by September, October, we'll have a pretty good sense of what our options are, our menus. I think I disagree. Commissioner Curley had stated that we don't really need to do studies. I think I agree with him and disagree with him. I agree that we can study things. Okay. Well, I, I agree that we, um, okay. Well, I think in order for us to make good decisions, we do have to have studies in front of us so we know what our choices are. And until I see what the choices are under stormwater management, I can't really make a long-term decision about stormwater management. So I'd rather have professionals tell me what our choices are than me try to tell them what our choices are. Um, at the same time, I've seen over the years that uh, studies have been used to delay inevitable outcomes. We've seen this over and over again. Um, 
in various areas of capital investment, capital uh, improvement, where we've done studies to delay things. So I hope we're not going to use studies to delay any more decisions, but I hope we have the information we need to make good decisions. So, Don, I apologize if I misquoted you at any point, but uh, I, I think the studies that we're asking uh, administration to do at this point are helpful and useful and will, it will give us more transparency of, of the complexity of what we need to do moving forward. There are my comments for now. Well, I think it's incredibly naive to think that you can continue doing the same and solve this problem. Uh, there are drastic changes in some manner that have to be made, whether it's a significant increase in taxes or a, a cut in services or impose more user fees. And when, every time when somebody comes up here and asks us for more and we're unwilling to say no, it, it's just exacerbating the problem. And I think you're just being incredibly naive if you think that this just coasting along without making significant changes is going to do anything here. Um, thank you for the excellent presentation, Bill and Bob. Uh, Bill, I think you mentioned that we don't, I'm going way back to OPEB now in your presentation, we don't have a balance sheet or a statement of assets and liabilities for this past December 2011, is that right? We are finalizing those now okay. and they'll be published uh, either at the end of May or early June. You have, you gave us a huge amount of information, a lot of it we've already seen. But you have a statement on one of your pages. It's the slide that has OPEB at the top, and it says, however, the liability shown on the township's statement of net assets as of December 31st, 2011, will grow from $9.5 million to $12.6 million as a result of not funding beyond the pay-as-you-go amount. My only question is, how, what's the time period for that growth? What, what are we looking at there. Is that six years or? It's well, I'm not sure I understand the I question. I understand the question. It's the snapshot in time, Jim. It's, it's where we were at the end of last year, if I'm understanding it. Because of the decline in the asset value oh, and the growth in the liability, it's, it's a snapshot. It's what's, what, when they published our financial statements at the end of last year, our liability is going to be $12.6 billion, correct? Oh, okay. That's correct. Yeah, and okay. we went, the $9.5 million was the asset shown in our December 31, 2010 Ten, financial statement. Okay. So it's a 10 to 11 change. I follow. Okay. Um, Thank you, I, I don't have the grasp that my fellow commissioners have at this point because they all have more experience here. But I... There is the issue of sale of properties, and I think that really merits some, some careful consideration. For example, the Kreutzberg Center. Um, are, is our tenant there paying um, market-based rates? Have we ever done an evaluation of that? No, they do not. They don't pay that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, Bob, you said that we are going to be faced with uh, pouring money into that building to save it, or to at least keep it That's That's from, correct. Um, so I, I guess this is a rhetor rhetorical question. Is there any, any reason we should continue to own the Kreutzberg Center? Jim, under, if, if you don't mind, under yeah. the uh, Deed and Donated Act, we yeah. cannot sell off any public land. However, we can divest it in the sense that we could get partners to take on all that, all that uh, responsibility of maintaining such a property. And I think we've moved in that direction. And I hope to, you know, to that point, you know, the, man, the Willow's Mansion, the Cottage, Kreutzberg Center, you name it, these properties that we're currently, you know, responsible to maintain, we may not necessarily be able to sell, but we may be able to enter into agreements, long-term agreements that help those entities fund mm -hmm. and maintain sure. those properties. Well, that statute, I don't think handcuffs us, John, from selling the properties. Yes, and I would also, I wouldn't agree that that's not my understanding of what John Rice tell it. it provides difficulty, yeah. but it doesn't, yeah. in my understanding. There's a procedure to follow. For example, the Hugler, Hugler property on Lancaster Avenue would have to be offered back, and this is a hypothetical now, I'm not, would have to be offered back to the prior owner, owners, before we could say to 
um, a broker, we want to market this property. So it's not as if we're. Why would that have to happen if we bought that one? That one was a cash purchase. The others that have been donated, I understand that better. But that one was a cash purchase. Uh, I don't. As to all land that is public use, parkland, and open space. And it's not impossible, you're right. It is, you have to go through a procedure in orphans court, and you have to make the case as a township that there's no, no longer a valid public use. And um, the law has somewhat changed since probably Hugler, um, the Erie case really kind of set the rules for this type of transaction. Okay. And that's the case that John Rice shared with all of us. So uh, it is not impossible, and if we as a community decided that we, there was no m more valid public use for a certain piece of property, we went to Orphan's Court and we did not have opposition, certainly we could do it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's a big if. Yeah, yeah all of these have, <laughs> have ifs tied to them, but I think as Kevin Higgins said, we, it's maybe time to be creative uh, to, to find solutions here. Um, The, excuse me for asking probably dumb question, but did, are, are we the lessor or lessee at Sulpizio? We, we're the owners there? No, we're not. The school district is. We lease okay. from the okay. so, school district. But you have that listed here as, a, as if we are the owners. We had that to look at the consolidation where the possibility of us div divesting that back to the school district and then also having a facility incorporated within there as a recreational facility similar to what Sapizio Gym okay. is where you'd have cross access between seniors and the okay. library as well, and especially based on the fee schedule that is out right now until we determine what that cost is going to look All like right. as well. Um, the Studio 21, uh, as John Nag Nagel informs me, we could, if we were able to consolidate those operations into this building, we would be saving the lease payments that we pay to the, the well, we don't pay them. We're, we're reimbursed by Comcast and Verizon, I, I believe. But that's money that we could, um, we, we could avoid uh, and put, put basically put into our own pocket. Um, I don't think it's feasible to sell the township garage or to move from there because we went through um, agonizing so, uh, searches in 1990 and 91 when I was on the board to find a better garage than what we had. Um, and honestly, the only area that anybody seriously considered was in the, in the Ardrossan area to site the garage at the time. So we all decided that it was best to leave it where it is, to build a new facility, raise the old building, and then compensate the people on Cromer Road there. So I, I think that's really not feasible to be thinking of selling that. Uh, just to summarize, I, I think we have to be creative and um, help ourselves get out of this hole that we're in. Bob, just back to the, to the land sale. The Township Managers Association that you're part of, is that a mm -hmm. topic of discussion? Because it sounds like the, some of it is a legislative issue I think this is a trend now given the economic times looking at your portfolio I guess it would be is now is an opportunity where if you have properties looking at what those costs are for maintenance I think that's a lot of it that when you acquire property a lot of times there's a, an attached cost of maintenance and that's something I think that we're going to be looking at too is what are those costs to maintain property maintain real estate um, you know can changes be made to there because again too not only do you sell the asset um, but also, too, there's a reduction in operations costs and maintenance costs that may go along with those particular items. So that is something that it is, it is a trend uh, in which a lot of communities are looking at what they hold and what can be gotten rid of. But also, there's certain pieces of property that are valuable to the township as well as open space and those types of items. But I think this is for the township here, and I think it echoes back with, with what uh, some of the commissioners have said. Now is an opportunity for us to look at, really look at everything and maybe some things that are held very close to us, near and dear to our hearts, that maybe those are things that we have to push away and look at objectively and see what at the end of the day, what are those costs and is it necessary for us to continue in those particular ways and hold on to certain assets or to continue on in certain programs or services that we provide that are not beneficial to the township. 
Uh, one particular item that I know that Tammy's been working on a lot is costing, uh, you know, putting detail cost to all her programs that are provided there to basically look at what programs don't break even that we have to subsidize or those worth continuing and really trying to look at that operation to try to break itself even in what it does or even generate revenues in particular areas. So there's a lot of detail that's being put together in that area as well. Okay, but, but, uh, perhaps I didn't ask my question clearly enough. Um, is the Managers Association talking about lobbying legislators to adjust the legislation to make it easier to sell public property? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. No. But I think there's also remedies that are currently existing under the law that you could walk down those roads if necessary. So uh, for the fellow commissioners or my fellow commissioners, what's the best way to get specific on this? My sense is that we should either have some kind of subcommittee meeting, which I would be happy to do in community development, or a special meeting of the Board of Commissioners in which we bring hypotheticals and we test those hypotheticals. And then from there, we become particular and that then we do a more robust analysis of, of those particulars. Well, it's my understanding that the, um, the real estate assessment RFP that we sent out, I mean, I could be wrong on this, would, would give us not only what properties we hold, how much they're worth, but also some sort of idea of their marketability. So, which is kind of the starting point of the conversation, yeah. right? So, I mean, in my view, we really need that information to have a meaningful conversation about this. I mean, I, you know, some of the things that we own are not marketable for whatever reason. And I'm, I'm thinking that's going to come out. I'm hoping that comes out of that work, that, that um, yeah. our, the firm, whoever we choose from that RFP, um, gives us as work product. So the part of that that I would respectfully disagree with, which is why I'm proposing an alternative, is that our decision to sell a piece of land is really not going to be decided on the market marketability of the land. It's really going to be a decision that we make that's very much on non-market-based factors. At least that's my sense. So I, when I use political, I mean small p political. It's a policy decision that we're going to make that's going to be guided by the market value of the property, but probably not decided by the market value the way other sales typically are. So, so my sense is before we look at the, the marketability of particular properties, we need to look at the palability of selling it. And then, uh, so I, I just think the orientation is a little different than, than you have it, Elaine. So that would be what I would, how I would like to proceed. If I could recommend, I think Don, through your, possibly to be able to hold those particular meetings and then work along with Steve in regards to, you know, the real estate assessment, because there's part of it, and I think what Commissioner Schaefer um, is looking at with the, having that is we need to complete our files, that actually we have a complete and accurate file of all the real estate that we own. So I think that's one component we look at, but also, Don, I think through your committee to have, have the conversation. Okay, and there's nothing helpful. that, I mean, we don't, we can then Emerging from the subcommittee would be not particulars, but still just essentially engage, just having the conversation and discussing hypotheticals. So I don't know that it necessarily competes with the uh, idea that you have, Elaine, but sort of augments it in some ways. So I'd be willing to do that. I think that would be a good way to proceed, Bob. My position aligns with Elaine's in that before I can even think about selling properties or going down that road, I want to know if it's, what's it going to do for Radnor Township to sell those properties? If we find out that the only piece of property we have that's really sellable would be like Hugler because of where it sits, you know, aren't we just spinning our wheels? So I, I think it's important to get this assessment done. Do you have any other commissioner comment? So what's the timing for the assessment being done? Our hope is we'll have a recommendation to the board on the 14th as soon as we get them going. I believe we're probably going to be looking at a 60 to 75 day period, depending if we can move the selected firm along during that process. So I think you could run concurrently at the same time what I think what Don was recommending along with this evaluation too, which I think would be helpful with that if the board selects a consultant to be able to work along with them at the same time. Okay, if we don't have any more comment or discussion from the commissioners, we are anxious to hear from our public on all of these issues. 
So come on up. Hi, good evening. Sarah Armstrong, Radnor resident. This is fabulous work. Thanks to staff and Saint, thanks to CARFAC. It's, the numbers are tough, but um, it's great to have real numbers and start to make some decisions. A um, couple of uh, comments and a couple of questions. One comment, the, um, the 22 million of unfunded pension liability, just to put that a little in context, would be all taxes collected from all residential taxpayers for two years. So just, just so that those who don't uh, work with the numbers all the time get that point. Um, the civilian pension is it's across the board there, distress level two, but we're starting to get towards distress level three with the civilian pension. So we're going to have to be very careful about that. The one thing that we haven't talked about with the millage increases, tax increases, is that Radnor Township enjoys a very high collectability rate. We have very, very low bad debt, I'll call it for those business people out there, very low bad debt experience. So we can look at other county, the county taxes, uh, com compare ourselves to other municipalities. Um, last time I looked at it, which has been a while, it was about 2%. So I think, I think there's a tipping point when you, when you raise taxes to a certain level that your bad debt experience rate is going to increase and therefore your collections go down. So I don't know if in doing the budgeting whether we're taking into account uh, yet thinking about, okay, well, we normally apply a 2% bad debt experience that we're, never, we're not going to collect that money. That may be five. That may go to seven. That may, you know, so just think about that as moving forward. The, the real estate assessment project, I'll call it, I think we're possibly confusing two things. One being doing the assessment to determine what to sell, which is a budgetary activity, and doing the assessment because when I looked at the records in 2010 as part of CBFAC, um, they were, as everyone knows, in terrible condition. And I think the township has a responsibility, possibly even a requirement, to gather all the data and have all of the correct data in the files. So, I think there's, regardless of whether or not the project is being thought of to sell parcels, to Bob's point, we, we still need all those records put together. And then my last is a question, which is talking about the municipal works facility. Does it have to be in the township? I, I don't know the answer to that question. We're talking about where to put it and neighborhoods and stuff. I, I've seen um, school buses being put in all different parts, you know, down by Henderson Road, there's now a school bus depot for some, and I'm not sure the answer to that. So maybe there's an opportunity down by uh, King of Prussia to put it, or just something to think about. I don't know the answer to that question, but thanks. Great, great job. Absolutely fabulous. Uh, Martin Heldring, 305 Audubon Avenue, uh, Wayne resident. A uh, couple of comments as well. Um, one, I'll go to the budget in a second, but I just wanted to come back to a topic of roughly a month ago when you uh, refinanced the bond relating to this building. And um, uh, we talked about it a lot. I, I thought it was the right thing to do. I thought it was very rushed. Um, I asked at the time for you to kind of monitor rates subsequently and um, query Mr. Wolf if they went in his direction. So I took the liberty of doing that. If you go back to um, March 26th, they've dropped 10 basis points since then. They, they stayed the same one day and then went straight down. So I, I would think you can do this in private, but I would think having another conversation with Mr. Wolf would be a good thing. And maybe a little competition for Mr. Wolf in the future would be a good thing. I mean, when you look back at the rates through the year, this, you hit the peak from, um, since January 11th. Uh, it's not, you know, again, it's hard to predict interest rates. I, I'm not trying to be overly critical. I just think Mr. Wolf was here maybe with a little bit of self-interest in terms of the timing. Um, with regard to tonight, I also want to say and echo Sarah's comments. Uh, it's, it's fantastic work. It has come so far. Uh, I will have only one comment with regard to the report uh, in terms of a recommendation. Uh, because it synthesizes what many of us have been saying for two years and, and others going back to the CBFAC, and, and that report captures it all in a fact-based way. So I, I applaud the work of CARFAC and the township in putting this forward. Um, the the qu two questions are uh, the forecast of the revenues and expenses are based on your base case. As I recall, when you did the forecast, there was a conservative case, a base case, and a, so we're talking the middle case. 
My, is that right? That is future iterations of the, the forecast will rebuild in the optimistic, pessimistic, and normal. But for now, it's basically at normal. We're in the middle. The middle okay. line, yes. So the only, the only recommendation would be, I think it's, uh, I remember, and I don't have the facts and the metrics associated with it, but I remember the most conservative case sort of being not, as, not even as bad as what we'd seen just two years prior. So I was questioning whether or not the conservative case was really conservative. So I think it's a good idea to remind people of the assumptions in that base case somewhere in that document. A absolutely. When, when the document's finalized and there's something to be published, there will, there will definitely be okay. dates and assumptions. And um, I assume that then in this as well, the pension costs are, um, your previous investment rate was eight or eight and a half, I don't recall, but they would be based now on the seven and a half. So I, I just want to remind everybody that I stood up here and uh, quoted some Rhode Island data on what happens if you don't hit the seven and a half. I think you remembered querying me on that. Um, I went and looked at Vanguard uh, funds. There's pages of them. To find a number that was 7.5% or higher in a 5 or 10 year range. Not many. So you can get to a bunch of bond funds, but I think we've seen that, right? As interest rates come down, prices go up. So I can, you can look at a lot of bond funds, and in 10 years or five years, you can, you can see them hitting the 7.5 or more. After that, I get to emerging markets, REITs, precious metals. Three funds. Hit 7.5 or higher in a 5 or 10-year time frame. My point in that is that's what this, ana and, uh, this analysis is based on, and that's the rate you've chosen. But to be transparent and fair to the community, you need to tell them that if we don't hit 7.5%, that number is a lot bigger. And the likelihood of seven, hitting seven and a half based on history isn't good, unless you're in precious metals. <laughs> I don't think so. I hope not. So I, I think that needs to be, you know, transparency, you need to explain that to people. This, um, I, as I said, I really applaud uh, what the township has done. As I listen to the comments up here, uh, I, I really applaud um, Commissioner Kagan's comments because I thought they were succinct and they hit it right on the nose. If anyone believes, based on this, that it can be business as usual, it's just, it's just an error, naive, whatever word you want to use. Um, the, the reality is you're facing the same problem that everybody faced in the private sector. It's the, it's the health care and post-employment a cost. You can, you can nibble on all the edges of all the other stuff, and probably there's some, some use there. I, I, I heard people say, well, we've done a lot of expense cutting and we're finished. My budget this year is a 20% growth, and, it, and they're asking for zero expenses, N minus one as a target. In the private sector, it never ends. We never walk to our boss and say, gee, I really worked hard at cutting expenses the last few years. Can I stop now? It just doesn't happen. You, only in government do you hear this, we worked really hard at it, uh, so we're done. It's, it's not reality. Um, but anyway, you can do all that. It's the pension and health care costs. And how do you get at it? Uh, you, Mr. Fisher, you um, mentioned negotiations with the union. In the private sector, of course, you can just move directly from uh, um, a, defined contribution, a defined benefit to a defined contribution plan. If you don't have that luxury, what do we see? We, we see um, American Airlines going bankrupt. You see Detroit wrestling with bankruptcy. It's, it's inevitable. Even Chicago, which most people, I think, would describe as a um, well-run city. It's an article in the journal just last week. Rahm Emanuel, the uh, new mayor, um, Obama's previous uh, chief of staff, um, says that uh, unless we reform quickly, the cost of these programs, retirement programs, will force taxes so high that you won't recruit a business, you won't recruit a family to live here. That's the glide path you're on. They're just a little bit further down the road. So how do you get there? Bankruptcy is one way. Outsourcing is another. We keep talking about services and moving things, but the reality is the way you get at it is fully costing things and deciding whether or not you can do them or you outsource them. And, and unless the unions and the employees are willing to negotiate fairly, that's the glide path you go on. It's, it's just inevitable. Everybody can fight it and argue about it, but it's inevitable. And to the employees, because I went through it, I had to find contribution, a defined benefit and went to define contribution. You know, the reality is I complained about it. I didn't like it. But instead of a defined benefit plan that really tied me to that company, 
I now have the flexibility to move anytime I want. I just have a 401k that it moves with me. And I control all the money. So I don't mind it. It's actually quite good. So there's a lot of resistance in the beginning, but it may be a lot, if I'm a younger employee in particular, I think it's a good thing to do. So it's just the reality. And the sooner you get on with it, the better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heldring. I would just like to note that I think it's unfair and inappropriate to disparage the motivation of our professionals when every single person in this room, our finance department, our car fac, all recommended going ahead with that bond. We were, with, we were being risk averse. We all, as together, in, without a, a single dissenting voice, decided to move forward with that. I, so. I don't think there were anything in my comments to question anybody's motives. I said at the time, you, I thought uh, it was an appropriate thing. You said self-serving. No, Mr. Wolf. Right. Well, Mr. Wolf's motives, uh, keep in mind, he's got to take what percentage of the underwriting when he does it? Six tenths of one percent. So some percentage. What's, it, what's to his advantage? In a declining rate environment, right? Because whatever he has to hold himself, he can sell off to the retail side, and it's easier to sell in declining rates. Now, whatever his motives were, it, does it not make sense to query him as to why you guys hit the high in the last three months? I think it's appropriate. It's perfectly reasonable. It's normal business. It, does not, it doesn't have to be an ethical or moral issue. It's just why then? Why the rush? If anybody comes into me with a rush, I usually say, let's take a minute and think about it. That's all I'm saying. Is there any other public comment? All right, do we have any other staff comment or commissioner comment before we wrap up? All right, do we have a motion to adjourn? Second? Yes, I motion to adjourn. All right. Okay.